Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think we've had a, a really visually rich day so far, so Sandrina and I really hope to continue that. Um, let's see. I think hopefully this slide will switch soon. There, there we go. Um, so we are going to be sharing with you today about an artist named Panchal Mansaram. He often spelled his name P. Mansaram, and uh, he usually left the space out, so it's not a typo on our part. It's, it's how he wanted it. Um, and he is an artist uh, who was born in India. So we're talking about South Asia, sorry, not South Africa, South Asia, uh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, that part of the world. He was born in India in 1934. Um, and spent more than 50 years as a practicing artist in Canada and um, passed away recently in 2020. Uh, he had some success during his lifetime, but it, he never really gained that recognition in the Canadian art establishment. Um, but recently, there seems to have been a reckoning with his art, uh, a renewed kind of interest in it. There's been some local exhibitions, there's been some writing done on it. And I'd like to think that that is in part due to some of the work we've been doing at the ROM for the past many years. Um, so we're here to share that with you. And I'll just warn you that our presentation is a bit like a collage, which was a technique that Mansaram used quite frequently. And we're gonna kind of go back and forth a little bit um, and uh, give you kind of peeks into his work and uh, his practice and his life. And there is a lot of images and information in the beginning, and then we kind of slow down in the end. So just to give you a highlight of that. So this is, um, I just wanna start by showing you, this is Panchal Mansaram, he's in his studio, um, which is in the basement of his home in Burlington. And um, I met Mansaram in 2002, shortly after I moved to Toronto. And you know, his, he kinda, kinda had a gentle persistence that made me go to the studio um, frequently over the years. And I would found myself, every time he'd kind of talk about his life and talked about his practice, I felt compelled to hit the record button on my phone. And I felt like the story that he was telling me was not just about him himself, but really about mid 20th century art practice. This was a larger story and about how the global south, how diasporic artists fit into that. Uh, here, I just want to show you also Mansaram's wife, Tharu, uh, or Tharunika is her full name, and you can see them here also in their house in Burlington. And um, Tharu was just a support for him throughout his life and his practice, and she was a practicing artist herself, primarily a ceramicist, and you can see some of her work on the wall behind them. Uh, she also collected a lot of folk art and craft from India and decorated their home with it. So in some ways, their lives together was, was really a kind of immersive art experience. So this is me with Mansaram in his basement studio going through some of the many, many boxes and materials that he had. Now, I've acquired a few works of Mansaram's over the years. Um, but when he started talking about downsizing, and he started saying, oh, I'm thinking of throwing everything out, or maybe I'll burn everything, <laughs> I felt like as a curator, okay, now it's time to think about a strategy of how are we going to preserve his legacy and this massive archive of artwork produced in Canada that it felt like very few people knew about. And it also felt important because it was the kind of material that I felt was gonna help us rewrite Canadian art history in the future. So from 2015 to 2017, uh, I brought in more than 700 pieces of Mansaram's work into the Rams collection that represented basically the breadth of his career. Um, this is now hardly something that we do as an institution on a regular basis, but in this case, it felt important and I really want to uh, thank and feel grateful to the support that the ROM has given to this over the years. Um, and since then, we've also collected about 20 boxes of archival materials that include correspondence with some of the greatest thinkers and artists um, in India and in Canada that Mansaram had. 
Now, I'll just mention that there was, this was hardly a solitary process. Many people were involved. And in fact, Sandrina was one of the first people um, I recruited to help with this project. Um, you can see her on the top left uh, with Mansaram going through some boxes. Uh, she was recommended to me by some colleagues in the Museum Studies Department at University of Toronto and came in and in fact spent a whole summer in that studio basement um, organizing and inventorying all of Mansaram's stuff so that I could come in and actually make selections in an informed way. Um, other people involved included Aruna Pandey and Rom's head of media, Randy Drager. You see that in the top middle fold of a photo. They created actually a film uh, that interviewed Mansaram and Tharu. Uh, the film is called Collage in capital letters with an exclamation point. And in fact, you can find that online if you search it. Um, and we also had, for example, like Rom. Uh, uh, collection specialist Gwen Adams, um, our painting conservator Heidi Sobel, who all helped move the material, and you see them in the top um, right photo with Sandrina, moving the material to the ROM, and others, including Aileen Zara, also from the University of Toronto, who in fact helped move the material from Montserrat's house into the retirement home when in fact he did downsize. And then just to mention again that there were, have been other people involved throughout the years in sharing Mansaram's work. The first time I saw it was in a, an exhibition in the home of Ali Adel Khan, who had that exhibition in his basement of his home in Oakville. Um, that was the first time I had encountered Mansaram's work, and you see that in the top right photo. But other sort of shows, important shows that he's had, but again, a kind of limited exposure. Um, an Ed video gallery at the top uh, left, the Art Gallery of Mississauga, uh, curated by Stuart Keeler, bottom left, and the most recent show at the Art Gallery of Burlington, curated by Indu Vashist and Tulin Tuk from the South Asia Visual Arts Collective. Maybe some of you had a chance to see that. Okay. Uh, so I had wanted to work for the ROM since I was a child visiting with my family, uh, and so having the opportunity right out of the gate of finishing my uh, Master's of Museum Studies was a dream come true. So thank you to Polly. Um, so I got to spend the whole summer uh, at, in 2014 at Mansram's house phot photographing, inventorying, and reorganizing the art collection. Uh, so this you can see a before and after of Mansram's storage room. Uh, it also gives you a glimpse into what kind of treasures we were seeing in there. Uh, from, the moment, from that moment on, I was involved in the majority of the ROM and other institutional interactions with Mansram uh, to both provide assistance to Mansram, uh, but also to continue building the knowledge base I was caretaking about the artist. Uh, I enrolled in my, to do my PhD in information with Mansram and his collection as my case study, uh, and I spent most of 2018 doing, uh, as my supervisor, Kara Krampotich, who's here today, uh, she called it a deep hanging out with the artist and his works. So as you can see here, uh, we sat in his living room talking about individual works and the experiences around them. Uh, I even went to his home in India, in Mount Abu. I met his brother Pratap uh, and steeped myself in all the creative contexts of these works. My resulting dissertation, entitled Intermaterial Collaboration, encourages the rigorous collecting of crunchy knowledge or rich contextual detail about museum-bound objects. I'm continuing my research on Mansram through the generous support of the Art Canada Institute. As part of their Redefining Canadian Art History program, ACI funds the creation of free bilingual art books that, and I quote, revisit and redefine the framework of art history in Canada through studies on Canadian, Indigenous, and diaspora artists who are, whose lives and works are underrepresented. Uh, and Mansram's story was chosen to be part of the first cohort of this program. So now I just want to take you through some sort of formative moments uh, in his lifetime to help you kind of contextualize and understand his work better. Um, so Mansaram um, spent his childhood and grew up in a place called Mount Abu, which is in the Western Indian state of Rajasthan. Rajasthan is known as a big tourist destination. Mount Abu is um, sort of in the hills, a little cooler, and was in fact built up as a colonial town when British colonialism um, had, um, uh, was in India. And um, that was a site that kind of shaped his kind of worldview quite, quite a bit. 
It was also known for some ancient elaborate Jain temples. When Mansuram was a childhood, in fact, he lost many of his family members to a typhoid pandemic. And from that, as a way to recover, he found solace in nature, but also in cinema. And if anybody knows anything about Indian cinema, you know that this is an industry that is extremely visually rich, full of music and dance. And so thinking about the kind of aesthetic environment he immersed himself in from an early age. He had an inclination from early on uh, as an artist and went to what at that time was the most prestigious art school in India called the Sir JJ School of Art in Bombay, uh, what's now Bom Mumbai. And um, it was a very exciting time. India had just um, gained independence from British colonial rule. And there was a lot of debates around art, like how do you create a new kind of art for the nation and yet still honor India's traditional pre-colonial past. Um, at the same time, artists at the time wanted to be part of an international art scene. And so you see Mansaram being part of this, um, this uh, exchange of ideas um, in this early image uh, painting that he did, um, uh, showing actually a scene in Nepal. Um, and you can see sort of him working with um, a, an artistic language based in realism, and so this is sort of a scene with a, a woman with a child on her back, uh, which looks like in a kind of town square. Uh, and yet he's also using a, a language of abstraction to depict the scene, and the choice of colors aren't necessarily descriptive of what he saw, but in fact reflect a more emotional landscape. He also obtained a fellowship to go study in Amsterdam. And while he was there, he encountered what was called the Cobra Group. And this is a group of artists who at the time were really involved with artistic experimentation that involved spontaneity, intuition. Uh, you see the artist group on your top left and an example of their artwork on the bottom left. And they were very much involved in bold colors, a kind of layering of imagery, almost like collage, as well as including folkloric elements. An early piece by Mansaram reflects some of this experimentation. You see that on the right, where he's actually glued um, kind of ex uh, fragments of Rajasthani popular culture. Here you see a print showing the Hindu god Ganesh. Um, and he's kind of collaged it onto this piece of paper and um, also done a kind of spontane spontaneous um, ink wash uh, drawing on top of it. So when he went back and settled in India, it wasn't very long that in fact he applied for immigration to Canada. And frankly, this happened on quite a whim. Um, it turned out that he lived down the street from what was the new Canadian embassy in Delhi. And out on one of his walks, he thought, oh, let me go in here and check out what this building is. And I actually have a feeling he might have been the first one to submit an immigration application at the Canadian embassy in Delhi. Um, and before you know it, it had been approved and him and his wife and uh, Taru and small um, baby Mila, you can see them, oops, <laughs> I can't point there, uh, Mansaram, Taru, and then the baby Mila in the bassinet there, um, along with, in fact, Taru's large extended family, which for him really, I think, um, uh, filled those holes of the loss of his own family um, at the airport at the moment of their migration to Canada. And I think it's, it was a time um, in the 1960s um, that, he, that a lot of uh, South Asians, uh, especially from India, were migrating abroad and in particular to Canada. And I love that, in fact, there were professional photographers at the airport ready to take families' photos <laughs> to mark that occasion. So, um, when Mansaram came to Canada, he settled in very quickly into the art scene here. Um, and he had in fact become aware of the work of theorist and um, philosopher Marshall McLuhan, uh, whose ideas around media and technology really impacted him, but also with which he felt there was a great deal of synergy. Um, you might know uh, Marshall McLuhan's famous line, the medium is the message which refers to how technology was not just a vehicle for information, 
but in fact shaped how that information was received and how we understand the world around us and ourselves. And their relationship continued throughout Mansaram and Marshall McLuhan's life, lifetimes. Um, at the bottom right photo, you actually see both Mansaram and McLuhan sitting with the art gallerist, Av Isaacs. And it was in fact Ab Isaacs who um, recommended to Mansaram saying, hey, if you wanna continue practicing your art, one of the best ways to do it is to be an art teacher. And so um, Mansaram got a job as an art teacher in the Hamilton School District. And so that's why his wife and him settled in Burlington. So Mansaram experimented with many forms and techniques to create art. Uh, the overarching connection between all of them was collage. So I'm gonna go through a really quick overview of the kinds of works you can see in the uh, collection of Mansaram. Uh, thick painting, which is paint that builds up on the, ca the canvas, was one of the earliest collage forms where he collaged paint colors, drawings, words, and images cut out of paper formats. This one, Noon Sun, is interesting because it was initially just that bottom canvas and it was framed, uh, but Mansaram decided it was incomplete and later had the smaller canvas added uh, so he could finish and build on it like a story, uh, like a final chapter of the book. Mansaram was exposed to printmaking in depth during his fellowship in Amsterdam in 63 and 64, uh, and it would continue to be an important part of his practice for decades. Here you can see an early etching he did in, Man uh, in Amsterdam of Amsterdam, uh, and a silkscreen collage he did in 1972. One of his most prolific forms of art was mixed media collage, uh, the majority of which makes up his rear view mirror uh, series, which is inspired by the theories of Marshall McLuhan. These works include many found objects. Uh, so in this one, it's hard to give. Uh, uh, that includes blocks of differently textured paint with objects like a, let's see, we have um, mass marketed uh, picture frames that were available at Loblaws at the time and given out with your groceries. You have a packet here with a Taj Mahal trinket. This is an aquarium postcard. And we have some plastic packaging toys in there and uh, old manuscript pages that he also then uh, did a print of in the work. Mansram also experimented with film, which also took on a collage quality. I love what an interviewer for an Indian magazine wrote about the conversation with Mansram during the filming of this one pictured, which is called Davy Stuffed Goat and Pink Cloth. The interviewer asked about the title, and Mansaram explained, well, that, that's what you see. That girl's the Davy, there's the stuffed goat, and there the pink cloth. All very simple. And when the interviewer asked, what are you going to do with the film, Mansaram's reply was simply, nothing. Why do something with it? Let it be. Let things happen. We'll see. Given how often Mansaram traveled and sent exhibitions of work between India, Canada, and Europe, it isn't surprising that he sought out a form of art that was more portable. Here you can see an example of his fabric collages uh, that also include found materials such as a rice bag. He would tape and pin the pieces together and have artisans in India sew them. He tried using other techniques uh, on fabric, such as hand dyeing cloth. And here's an, an, uh, on the right, there's an example of his continuation with printmaking. So he used cyanotype or blueprint for transferring photographic images to the fabric. Mansram enjoyed photography himself, having received his first camera in exchange for a commissioned portrait in 1959. While he used many of his photographs as collage materials, he printed several photographs in the rich black and white of silver gelatin print, uh, such as this photo while taken, uh, taken while driving around Ahmedabad on the back of a friend's scooter. When electro printing methods became commercially available, Mansaram jumped on them eagerly. Uh, he himself didn't own one, but he went to the Xerox machines in Jackson Square, uh, the mall in Hamilton, uh, and he experimented with the images that could be created by photocopying, blowing up, and manipulating images again and again through the photocopying process. These works were easily reproducible in light and could be used to create small art books that he could send as mail art, but blow up into 16 pages and paste on a piece of plywood and put that as a gallery piece. 
Later in Mansuram's life, uh, after his retirement from art teaching in 1989, Mansuram focused on a property in India where he was creating an art retreat. Uh, and there he found images in the rock formations uh, and accentuated them with tile and cement. Appropriately, he photographed these installations and used them for his final technique entitled uh, laser graphy, which is printing using a laser printer. Uh, which consists of, so he used photo editing software to add and embellish to the work and then printed it out all in one go. Mansuram created uh, hundreds of laser graphs using his extensive photograph library up until his passing. Uh, this penultimate style was ultimately dubbed uh, Mansa Media. So that's uh, like a, a very rich, quick overview of kind of the breadth of the different techniques that he was using. And I thought we could just kind of slow down a bit and look at one work more deeply to get a, a really a good sense of, of what some of the ideas and, and materials he was working with. So this uh, painting collage that you see is one of his most well-known works. And I would say one of I would say one of his best works as well. It was done soon after he um, immigrated to Canada. You can see the date there, 66 to 68. And it is a mixed media collage with paper and paint on board. And this whole piece is called um, Maharaja. Now, it is one of the early works in his rear view mirror series. Uh, Sandrina showed you one of those collage works. This is another one. And basically, the rear view mirror series was based on Marshall McLuhan's writings, where he talks about how life is about fragmentary experiences. Um, and that it is a, a perspective. Looking through the rear view mirror, it's a perspective of um, experience of being in a car, moving forward, but with one eye on the past, seeing the world through small fragments, akin to contemporary media saturated culture. And so what you're seeing here is imagery, uh, found imagery um, collaged on a, a large piece of board. The work is about a meter and a quarter tall and a meter and a quarter wide, so it's actually a very good size. And what you see is a lot of kind of popular imagery, um, in particular of the large face in the center here is um, the well-known ruler of Jaipur, which was the main city in Rajasthan. Um, uh, but he ruled in the 19th century and he's sort of known as the father of modern uh, Jaipur. As well, you have small figure um, images of Pierre Trudeau. And I'm actually shocked that we're only second talk in in the morning and he's come, his name has come up twice now. <laughs> but you have here, here he is right there. Um, you have him right there. Uh, and I think there's a small piece there. And these are just you know, images from newspapers and magazines that were lying around that Mansaram cut up and happened to collage on, on, the, on this work. And in some ways, the term Maharaja refers to both of these figures, Ram Singh II and Pierre Trudeau, who the latter was known as the father of modern Canada. And so in many ways, the work is about how the persona of these individuals in some ways it was more a product of their media representation than any kind of individual person themselves. And so thinking about them as kind of a product of their media representation represented through their media representation. Other things that you see around this image um, include, for example, um, fragments of Sanskrit manuscripts, astrological charts from India, and then um, images from magazines that have been ripped up. Here you have like an Indian beauty with a parrot, um, and here an, a Hindu god with an elephant, uh, and then lots of doodles that Mansaram did as well. Um, and in many ways, all of these materials, like the pages from the Sanskrit manuscript, for Mansaram, these weren't esoteric religious texts. In fact, there were forms of popular culture around in the daily environment. They weren't precious. It were, they were all forms of a kind of low-tech existence that, um, that populates our life and that he's kind of collaged together in this one piece. Wait, what's that? Okay. Uh, 
the thing that interested me most as I got to know Mansram and his collection was how there was no claim of sole artistic genius that meticulously planned and directed every step of the artwork from start to finish. Uh, in fact, Mansram regularly deferred agency or the capacity of something to act and change the course of a process to the materials that he used. Uh, I decided to think deeply about this through my doctoral research, um, and Mansram would often attribute the inspiration for starting a work to what m some would consider to be benign everyday moments, like drinking his chai in the morning, looking at a tree in the backyard, uh, and the feeling of driving and considering if the car is moving or is the landscape moving. Some theories consider how even inanimate things like tea and trees and cars can be active participants in interactions. For example, the use of a particular paint can affect what kind of tools are needed to uh, be used to manipulate it effectively. Uh, if the paint was not used, the situation would then play out differently, and as such, the paint is actually an active participant. Uh, what I found was that Mansram was tuned in to the activity of these materials and paying attention to the forms they dictated taking. Instead of choosing materials and forms to suit the image he wanted to create, he let the materials and the resulting forms decide what the image would be. Uh, the artworks were collaborations between Mansram and those materials, uh, or what I called an intermaterial collaboration. Mansram, so to conclude, we're wrapping up now. Uh, Mansram's story is rich and illuminating, the value of which is only just starting to be explored. The theory I am currently exploring, which will be expanded upon in my art book for ACI, is that his attention goes beyond materials and moves into the intangible things like culture. I'm proposing that Mansram is a practitioner of worldly affiliations, which means that he was a cosmopolitan artist who was rooted in India, but created a new kind of culture and being through participation uh, in the cultural flows, not only of India, uh, but also Canada and everywhere that he then uh, visited. This work, New Landscape, encaps encapsulates that concept. Uh, his landscape includes details that are abundant to Canadian landscape painting, but collage with details that are not quite attributable to any one influence. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this and many other incredible details about Mansram's life with the public through my ACI book, which will be available online probably next year. <laughs> I, I have a concluding thought too. We're not quite done yet. <laughs> Last work though. <laughs> um, this is uh, in fact a more recent work uh, that Mansaram did really towards the end of his life and it's an example of the Mansa media, uh, a technique that in some ways was so uncategorizable he, he just called it after himself, Mansa media, which was um, imagery manipulated on the computer, um, uh, manipulated then with acrylic by hand, further scanned, put back on the computer to the point where the technique then just blend one blended into another. So Mansa Media and this um, wonderful work um, showing a village town named Pushkar uh, from Rajasthan is actually hanging currently in the office of the Rams director. Um, so just a few concluding thoughts from me. So while Mansaram might have been unusual in the Canadian art scene, he was also unusual in the Indian art scene. Um, he's an artist whose long artistic practice was grounded in a sense of experimentation with technology. It was a low-tech engagement that, shaped, that was shaped by his sensitivity to an image-saturated culture, where signs and their messages were fluid and could be experienced as visual forms alone. So for me, in many ways, his work is a reflection of his diasporic identity, this kind of like unmooring from any one place in particular, manifest in visual form. And for me, this is important because in many ways, you know, um, nationalist art narratives aren't sufficient to understand his work. So when we think of things like modernism, you know, which gets defined as an art movement that reflected the broad transformations in 20th century society, and these days we even talk about you know, multiple modernisms around the world, in many ways those narratives are still connected to a nationalist art framework. In re reconceiving art um, as a narrative about transnational flows, I feel Mansaram's work provides a model for a new path. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>